Beloved people of God, grace and peace to you from Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, Jesus' angry tirade in the temple does not fit with our common image of a gentle and compassionate Jesus. Nor is it easy to reconcile Jesus' cleansing of the temple with a nonviolent approach to life and ministry. Did not Jesus teach us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us? As Debbie Thomas explains, the story of Jesus cleansing the temple may even come across as an offensive one. The Jesus we'd rather keep tender and soft-spoken makes a whip of cords, drives sacrificial animals out of the temple, overturns tables, pours coins all over the floor, and tells the money changers to stop making his father's house a marketplace. When his stunned audience asks for a sign to authorize his violent actions, Jesus doesn't bat an eye. Destroy this temple, he dares them, and in three days I will raise it up. Truth is, Jesus was angry, extremely angry. We don't hear much about anger in mainline churches these days, observes Thomas. After all, there's something unseemly about rage, right? Something unsophisticated, something crude. It's not polite to get angry. And it's positively insupportable to stay angry. But Jesus, the temple of God, burns with zeal for his Father's house. Unquote. Now, precisely why was Jesus so angry? The cleansing of the temple took place at the time of the Passover. Passover was the holiest feast during which pilgrims journeyed to the temple in Jerusalem to make sacrifices. And during the Passover, the population of Jerusalem would increase from 50,000 to well over 150,000. Now, people traveling from afar could not bring their own animals to sacrifice. Only unblemished animals were uh, satisfactory or acceptable. And on a long journey, it was virtually impossible to keep animals unblemished. So when people arrived at the temple, they needed to purchase sheep, cattle, or doves. Money changers were necessary because people came from many nations, and only a certain coin was acceptable to pay the temple tax. The money generated supported temple activities throughout the year. The vendors and the money changers, therefore, would have tended to view themselves as providing a necessary service to support religious pilgrims and the temple. Jesus was not simply angry because animals were being sold and money was being exchanged in his father's house. In his fury, Jesus engaged in an angry demonstration against the entire sacrificial system. He completely disrupted the protocols and procedures in place to observe the Passover and make a sacrifice in the temple. He challenged the notion that an appropriate sacrifice would appease God and make one right with God. The temple was viewed as the primary locus of God's presence, so it was fitting to journey to the temple and to make one sacrifice there. Jesus called into question the central place of the temple in one's relationship to God. When the religious leaders asked him why he'd engaged in this angry tirade, Jesus gave them a curious answer. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now the religious leaders assumed he was speaking of the, the building, the temple building. Herod the Great was one of the greatest builders of all time. The rebuilding of the temple was his most ambitious project. It was a marvel of human construction. Now, I remember hearing a number of years ago that one of the main building blocks of this temple weighed about 412 tons. How could they have maneuvered such a block into place? As the religious leaders said to Jesus, this temple's been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? John 2, 21, however, offers this interpretation. Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. From the very beginning of his gospel, 
John affirms that Jesus is the incarnate Word of God. His body is the temple, the locus of God's presence on earth. Our relationship to Jesus is not dependent on making the proper animal sacrifice in the holiest of buildings. Our relationship with Jesus is a gift from God. Furthermore, we believe that the church, the community of followers of Jesus, is the body of Christ. As much as we may appreciate our church facilities, the presence of God is not confined to our church buildings. God's presence is embodied in our relationships to God, to Jesus, to one another, and to all that God has created. Now, the anger expressed by Jesus in the temple, therefore, is a holy anger. As Debbie Thomas asserts, Jesus' holy anger moves him to action on behalf of a more robust, equitable, holistic, and impassioned spiritual practice. Jesus interrupts business as usual for the sake of justice and holiness. His love for God, the temple, and its people compels him to righteous anger. In February, I taught a Christian ethics course for Andrew Langford and Ben Nicodemus. Andrew has completed his doctorate in biblical studies. Ben has one more chapter to write on his doctoral dissertation. Nonetheless, in order to be ordained in the ELCA, they need to complete some additional coursework, and this was part of it. One essay we studied was Beverly Harrison's The Power of Anger in the Work of Love. Uh, Pastor Robin's spouse, Janet, had Harrison as a professor at Union Seminary in New York. And Janet commented to me that this essay was the most important one Harrison had written. Harrison's thesis is that we Christians have come very close to killing love precisely because we have understood anger to be a deadly sin. She maintains that we should not assume anger is opposed to to love. Anger single signals that something is amiss in our relationships. Grasping this point, she asserts, is a critical first step in understanding the power of anger in the work of love. Where anger arises, there the energy to act is present. Harrison acknowledges that anger does not lead automatically to wise or humane action. So we have seen, for example, how destructive powerful leaders can be when they let their anger motivate them to seek revenge on perceived enemies. Personal relationships can be destroyed when we let our anger get the best of us and seek to get back at those we think have wronged us. The church is not immune from such vengeful anger. Many church communities through the centuries have been torn apart by members seeking revenge against one another. The problem, however, is not our anger in itself. The the key is how we channel our anger. Harrison goes so far as to claim that all serious human moral activity, especially action for social change, takes its bearings from the rising power of human anger. In a Christian century commentary on John 2, 13 through 22, our gospel reading for today, this commentary is entitled Jesus and Black Anger. Carrie Hassler Brook asks, who are the other enraged voices crying out from the temple with Christ? Who are the black warrior poets standing alongside the Joannine Jesus, pointing to injustice and shouting, stop? Do I hear the voice of Christ in this anger? Not only the anger I also voice, but the anger I must bear. The anger that names me, my privilege, my whiteness, my silence. At a reckoning with racism Zoom gathering on February 23rd, the keynote speaker was George Nakata. In May 1942, following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, George, then a nine-year-old Japanese-American boy, and his family were forced to give up all their possessions, leave their home, and then they were taken temporarily to the North Portland Livestock Yard, which is now the Expo Center. And then other Japanese-American families in Portland also had to join them. 
In September 1942, they were transported to a concentration camp in Idaho. The internment of these Japanese Americans during World War II is a disgraceful chapter in the history of our nation. It was painful to listen to the conditions they had to endure. After all these years, one could still hear the anger in George's voice. But he's chosen to channel his anger by sharing his story many times over, and, and you could tell he still loved this country, even after all of that. He expressed surprise by how little people know about our nation subjecting Japanese Americans to this during World War II. He has been quoted as saying, I believe that in America, freedom is fragile. We have been careless with our Constitution. Using the example of my people is why I tell my story. Now, during his talk, he mentioned two women who inspired him during his internment. One was First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who visited a concentration camp and then took a public stand against such camps in opposition to her husband, President Roosevelt. A second uh, woman was a teacher from Twin Falls, Idaho, traveled 25 miles to the camp uh, on a regular basis to help educate George and other children. Both Eleanor and this teacher faced criticism. The First Lady once said, do what you feel in your heart to be right, for you'll be criticized anyway. And she was a lifelong Episcopalian, well-schooled in the teachings of Jesus. Now, I'm not sure of the faith background of the teacher, but in any case, both women are shining examples of what it means to use the power of their anger to do the work of love. The power of anger can be channeled in constructive or destructive directions. Jesus' Jesus's angry cleansing of the temple, George Nakata, and Eleanor Roosevelt and the teacher from Twin Falls all demonstrate to us how powerful anger can be when channeled in the right direction. Be assured that anger channeled toward mercy and justice is a virtue of our Christian faith. In Jesus' name, amen.